Hello everyone and welcome to episode number two of our advent calendar. So today we will reveal another automation tool for Revit that you can use to help you with your daily tasks. But as a special treat, I also have Aaron with me who wrote all of these scripts and he will show us exactly uh, how he writes them, what environment he uses, how he tests them in Revit so that you can also learn how to write these scripts on your own. So let's open door number two and get started. So the tools we want to look at today are these three ones here under model control. Basically, the idea behind it is that if you're a BIM manager on a project with multiple people involved, you know, you have varying levels of Revit experience. It can often happen that some users will accidentally as they're clicking around the model you know move things and don't even realize what they're doing and it creates a bunch of error messages and you have to go in later and clean things up so you might want to lock things down and have some control over the model so that that can't happen and so to have that in a nice automated way we made these three buttons one is to lock the grids so that what i just showed you can't happen so here went through all of the grids in the project and tells you all 28 grids are now pinned. So if we go back now, you can see I can't drag this around anymore. You have the little lock also that's closed. And even if we tried the MV command for moving something, we get the message here, can't move the pinned element. And then we have the same thing, but for levels. So as you can see here, it went through all of the levels and pinned those. And that's especially nice for if we look at a section. So now if I was to try to move a section here, I can't do it. And that's of course very nice because often wall heights are linked to uh, levels or our ceilings are linked to it. So. Once you have those elevations defined for your project, you might not want anyone to accidentally change those. So it's nice to have them locked down. And then as the third one, you have locked links. So as we can see, we have some linked Revit models in here, uh, like the structure model, the HVAC model, and now these are all pinned so that their location can't change because often you have the problem that you spend a lot of time linking the models together, coordinating them, that they all have the same base point and that they link in together nicely. And then still somebody goes in and accidentally drags one of them without even realizing. So this makes sure that that can't happen. So now you also have any linked file uh, pinned. So these are just some very simple ways of how you can add some control. Of course, you could also execute all of these manually by uh, pinning them using the built-in functionality. But this just makes it a little bit easier. It's just one click and you know you catch all of the grids, all of the levels or all of the links. And then next I'll show you how the code behind each of them works. But first, our enemy are going to give you a demonstration how you can also write your first PyRevit script. Well, hello, Aaron. Nice to have you here today. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, hello, uh, TBG's fan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, well, show us how can you, if you've never worked with PyBevit before and you want to write your first script and you don't know anything, Absolutely. how can you start? For sure. Um, I'm pretty sure you had this very uh, fruitful video how they can start with, but I'm going to just focus on a very simple part for making very simple tool to continue. So technically you need to watch that video as well. This is just a simple demonstration. And, uh, and also what I'm presenting is not like an official way. There is tons of way you can do it. This is how we prefer a TBG. So just we present it that way. Yep. And uh, there is a different tool. Uh, you can use it for develop uh, Python. And I'm afraid PyRevit doesn't come with a built-in tool to develop that lines and write. Technically, they are text, but you need some application or program to collecting and run them. And uh, one of the favorite one is Visual Studio Code from Microsoft. It's free software, so you can easily have it. I got used to it for some years, so now I'm continuing using that here as well for PyRevit. Py 
Uh, the thing is, uh, though behind those tools, there is some structure which is very simple to make those tools. Uh, first of all, to start, I'm going to show this uh, from John Mark, uh, how you can have your tool for PyRabbit. Uh, technically, uh, this is a nested folder. Uh, previously, we talked about this extension, uh, how you can have tools. Technically, uh, in, inside of your extension folder, you create it uh, as you wish to name. I name it PyWIP Working Progress Extension. And inside of that one is important you put that extension as the name you wish. So whatever name you wish, and then you put that extension. And inside of that one, you have another folder. You call it pi, whatever you wish. It doesn't need to be pi, dot tab. And what is this? Technically in Revit, to have that tool, you need to name this one, right? So technically I'm naming, here is pi tbg. And the way pi Revit understand it is you put that extension dot tab as showed here. So whatever you name, you wish as a name dot tab. And again, inside of that tab, you need to define the panels as we can see in Revit. Some panels has more tools, some panel has one tool, whatever you want to put as a name of the panel, you, you should name it the, the, your, your name dot panel. So for, for instance, here is model control dot panel. This one is WIP dot panel. And depends on the number of the tool you wish, you put different tool. Here I have only one tool, call it VSC. And then to make it tool, you should name it dot push button. And if you have more, you can have another one dot push button, another one dot push button. And simply I have only one. And inside of that one, you had need at least two files. One is the PNG, technically the symbol or icon of that tool. And then one is script.py, technically the Python code, which gonna run uh, instruction, the code you're gonna run. That's the simplest way you can make any tool. And then if you, if we review it here, so you technically you need the extension as you wish that extension inside of that for naming the tab, you name whatever you wish that tab, Instead of the tab, you wish the panel dot panel, and then you put the name of the tool dot push button. And inside of that one, you need two file, as we said, one icon dot PNG, and then one script dot pi. That's a minimum thing you need to have one tool in PyRabbit. So just by having those folders set up is how you create the entire user interface Absolutely. for your PyRabbit script. That's very true. Uh, we can show, for instance, the other one we had. Uh, if I go back uh, here, we can see for extension. Uh, our Py extension comes with the Py TBG. And then inside of that, we have model control panel. We have sheet panel. We have view panel and we have tagged panel exactly according. This one is only for me because I'm developing that. So you don't need it. And instead of that one, let's go to model control. Then we have four tool here, lock read that push button, lock levels, lock uh, links, work set reports that push button. And inside of that each, there is two file, one PNG, one Pi. Great. Yeah. So sounds like setting up the user interface is yep. quite simple. Absolutely. And thanks to Pi Revit. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but now maybe the more scary part for anyone getting started Absolutely. is how to actually write the Python code to add the functionality. Very true. So you said you use Visual Studio Code. Exactly. Maybe you can give us a little of demonstration course, of yeah, that as well. Yeah, that's going to be uh, fun. So uh, technically, as we described, uh, I had that folder icon and scrape.py instead of all of them, we have a part is similar, like uh, the library we're using from PyRevit or the current document we are using. So part of those are absolutely uh, technically repeating into different uh, different tool we're going to use. So I'm not going to change anything there. I'm just going to do a couple of things after that. Um, as we described, we loaded some library from PyRevit. We loaded here, the current document. So technically that open document we have in Revit. And I have output to like a print or give warning or give inf information during I'm doing. And now, just for fun, let's do another thing. I will print hello that beam 
girl. Very simple. And there is no direct connection, right? So, but since we created this tool in Revit, this one, so technically, if I just save this file, I can easily run it in Revit at the same time. I just press Control S to save it. And then when I go back to Revit, if I press this button, technically I'm running that code live. Here Yay! it is. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. And then let's, okay, I'm trying different thing. I'm developing, right? So maybe I just try another thing. Print. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I should save it because uh, it needs to be saved. And then I run it again. Here it is. Thank you for having me. So very simple. Yeah. So this is your way of going back and forth when you're writing exactly. code. You use uh, this tool that you that you named VSC Connector, Visual exactly. Studio Connector, to exactly. test your code, test yeah, you parts should. of your code um, b before you implement it in your Absolutely. tools. Absolutely. Because you for, for creating one of those tools, you know, maybe you have 200 lines, 300 lines, different functions. And then you don't want to touch the code to make it a mess. So you do the thing in another one and then it's successful. You bring it to your code. So this is exactly what I'm doing. So let's do another shot. OK, one of the simple thing, usually you select element in Revit. So selection and I would say uh, Revit, I already loaded the, that library, get selection. And uh, let's print the name of that selection. I might pick more inf more than one element. So in selection. Uh, so we learned a lot about for loops in last video. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you elaborate on that very well. So it's very useful to look at that video because I'm just demonstrating here, not very elaborative. Uh, and then we say uh, print name of the element. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we should remember to save, otherwise it will not work. And let's go back to Revit. Uh, let's pick a couple of elements, this wall and uh, this wall as well. Okay, we go back to PyTBG. Since I saved, it should work directly. Here it is. We didn't remove the last part, but that's okay. And then we can see we can see the name of the first element, name of the second element. Okay, let's see. We also want to see the category. Uh, so I can say print uh, category dot. Category is property, so it's just simple like mm -hmm. a put category. And then let's run the code again. I saved it. Go back to Revit and then run it again. Here it is, walls, walls. Well, Since I mm -hmm. picked two, we have two. Yeah, simple. Yeah, very simple way of um, implementing code, testing it. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, thank you a lot. Thank you for having me. Hopefully we will see you again. <laughs> Great. So now back to our model control tools. As I said before, I was going to show you the code as well. So similar to what we showed before right we have the folder structure with we start with the um, tab then the panel is called model control and then in there we have the three buttons for the three tools we want to have in revit and then if we start with the log grid we have again our icon and then our python script and then as Aaron explained, the first few lines of code are usually always pretty similar. I think the only thing that's new is that this time we're not starting with a selection of elements because we want to get all of the grids in this example that are in the project, no matter what you have selected. So that's why we use this filtered element collector. Doc is our Revit project that we have open. And then of the class grid. So we want to get all the elements of the class grid in the document that we have open in Revit. And then we start a transaction that's called pin all grids. And again, like in the last video, we use our trusted for loops and if statements. So for every grid in grids, so our 
grids list. If the parameter pinned in the grid is not already true, then set it to true. So that means that now that parameter that says whether or not the grid is pinned is activated, basically. And then print a line to say just the, the grid name and that it's pinned now. And so then for each grid in that list, it runs that same command and prints the line that it's pinned. And in the end, then it prints a summary for how many grids it pinned. So which is then again, the length of the ar array that we just ran through, the, the length of the list. And so the nice way about how this works is that it will check all of your grids every time you run it but only work on the ones that aren't already pinned. So even if you've run this before and then you add some new grid lines, it will then still fix the new added grid lines for you and still tell your report about all that now all of the grid lines in the project are pinned. So for example, now we've run this already, but even if we run it again, it still will tell me that all 28 grids in the project are pinned. And then if we look at the one for the levels, we'll see that the script is very similar. So here, instead of grids, this time we look for the class level and we collect all of the elements. And then for the levels, they have the same parameter on the element that tells you if it's pinned or not. So we set that to true and we print the same kind of report. And last but not least, we're looking at the one for locking links. So here you make a list of links by looking for elements of the class Revit link instance. And then you start again, your for loop, your if statement, you go through all of the links and it has that same parameter called pinned that you set to true. And then we print the report. So it's three very simple, very similar scripts that you can easily implement and use in your project to just keep it a little bit tidier <laughs> and maybe give you some inspiration for what other functionalities you would like to implement. So that was it for today. I hope you enjoyed another very beginner-friendly PyRevit tutorial. Um, and yeah, let us know what you, what other things you would like to see in this series. We still have two more episodes to go in this PyRevit focused advent calendar series. So feel free to comment down below and then I'll see you in the next episode. Have a great day. Bye-bye.